tick, 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 tick. Hi there. Welcome to Tech Talk Weekly. I'm Bob from Creation Station. This is our weekly show where we talk about cats. <laughs> well, we talk about things other than just cats, but today we got a fun story about cats for you. We always give you three or four interesting stories, get you on your way in about 20 minutes. If there's a fun story about cats you want to send me, Creation Station at Broward.org comes right to me. Today, I've got Miss Sasha from South Cluster. Yes. Oh, it is programming month, so we're featuring all <clears> of our <throat> programmers. Sasha does South Regional and Southwest Regional Library and helps out with how many branches? I have 10 in total. Yeah, it's craziness. Yeah. Yeah. Tell, so tell people exactly what, what you what we mean when you're doing a cluster stuff like that, helping 10 branches with programming. So I have two regionals that I oversee their programming. And then the remainder, the eight additional branches, I'm in constant contact with, um, talking with them about programming, if they need help setting it up in our um, event management system, um, questions about other non-library events that occur within the library because we have meeting room spaces yep. that are rented. Yep. We have meeting spaces. We have conference rooms. Meetings. Yeah. I, I deal with it. And you've got a very cool auditorium multi-purpose <clears throat> room out there at Southwest Regional. Yes. Yes, I do. That's the South Regional has one nice, has nice too, but Southwest yeah. Regional just happens to have that big lobby with the multiple rooms right off of it. Yeah. Fit events and festivals. It's really nice. And it's, but we told everybody we we're going to be talking about cats. Yes, cats. So let's talk about cats. And you out there may have a cat, may not, but you probably thought, hey, we know most things about cats and especially the important stuff. It turns out we just figured out how cats purr. No, no scientists. There's no, never any proof of how they were doing what they're doing. And it turns out there is this tiny little 10 millimeter thing that's on their vocal cords that allows them to purr. Now, to be clear, we still do not know why they purr. Uh, I've got a, a link to, to the most recent version, which is from 2001 was the last time they did a study on why cats purr. No, to have been yeah. really good scientific understandings. Um, what do you think, Sasha? You know, I mean, they say healing, but in all honesty, I, I have two um, <clears throat> house panthers <laughs> and um, they kind of purr for, for literally anything, especially treats, especially. Well, and treats. there you go. And that's one of the key things. And by the way, I'll, as always in the show notes for you, links to these direct articles. So you can go make up your own mind about why you think your cats purr, but yeah, it, it, that's one of those ones that seems to be a really common thing. Is like yeah. they want to purr for something. And one of the things that they found out as part of this article, the study here on how they purr, two separate things, part of the how they purr is it turns on an automatic system that just continues running. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's like, huh. Yeah. So it's not quite hiccups. <laughs> No, <laughs> but it's like kind of a thing that just like once your body starts doing it, it's hard to get it to stop. Yeah. So it appears my understanding of reading all this stuff here <clears throat> and, and reading the original scientific thing is it seems like cats have to tell themselves to stop purring yeah. once they do. Actively, actively yeah. stop themselves from making the noise. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. It's the craziest yeah. thing. Yeah. So it's a fun, it, I just thought this is a fun little story. This is a nice, easy, in these day, this day and age right now, we need good, cool, fun stories like this. Yeah. One. It's, it's harmless. It's yeah. so fun. And then we have the giant robot story that you yes. found. This yes, I did. is, so you get an extra 3 million around? <clears throat> no, no, no. But I, I'm telling you. If I if I win Powerball, I, I may seriously consider. It you know, is a pretty awesome thing. I mean, like you you can live your best Gundam life or yes, you know, exactly. Voltron there you go. Fantasy right there. Yep. So officially, these are not robots. They're exoskeleton suits. 
Uh, if you've seen the movie Alien, which if even I have seen a movie, I'm hopefully everybody else has seen it, where they get into these types of suits, you know, mechanical, large factory type things running around and doing stuff. And it can actually, uh, let's see if they got, the, yeah, here we go. And it yeah, can drop that. Yeah, you can become a car. Video to watch what it does. Yeah, it's just insane. You can drop down, become like a little transformer mm -hmm. thing and drive around as a car. Not that I yep. would want to be doing that in South Florida. It does not look like this thing has air conditioning at all. No, it, it probably doesn't. It's probably just a tiny little cockpit that you shove yourself in. Yeah. And, um, you know, move around in. It whatever. is. But now, <clears throat> I really thought this was interesting because they basically have said, we have the money to build these things right now. They're going to mm -hmm. build five of them. Yeah. And sell them at $3 million each. And then they're going to take the money from that to go build new, better versions of them. So if you yeah. want like a Mark I version, hey, here you go. Yeah. For the small, small price of $3 million. Yeah, $3 million. I'm like, wow. Yeah. 15 feet tall, 3.5 tons. Now, this was not the only robot in the news this week. Uh, Tesla did a, a thing over the weekend. We we're talking about their new robot. Just want to give you a picture. Here is the new Tesla robot. On the left is the one that they advertise. Like, this is Tesla. We're building these robots. I'm going to be selling them to people. The picture on the right are the robots that Tesla actually uses <laughs> in their factories because they're not building these fancy humanoid robots to, to work in factories because, as you saw in the previous one, Real working robots look a lot different because you want them to, they only need three fingers. They don't need five. And you want them to have many more joints than just, you can't even see me as I'm waving my wrist around here yeah. trying to, to show. You want six articulated joints, not three like we have as humans. But that being said, it's pretty cool. It is. It is pretty cool. <clears throat> it is it is a very cool robot and um yeah i'm sure they'll they'll find people to buy yeah each and every one of the, the ones temi is very cool the library mm -hmm. robot temi if you visit one of our libraries it'll be out at the african-american research library next week um it's currently at main library oh, you can come see it much nicer prettier smaller petite thing than this but yeah Robots are coming. I think there's no way around that. And then we have, we don't really die. Just in but, time for, you know, Halloween. Oh, I, I thought this was a great theme <laughs> on this one. So we are not talking as much in a spiritual sense here as we are in a physical way of life. You have a body, it's going to physically die. We all know, or most, most people know, there's a whole biome living inside of you. You've got gut bacteria and all the various cells and pieces and all the little things running around inside of your bloodstream and in your digestive tract, et cetera, et cetera. When you die, it turns out they don't die with you. No, they don't. They get to keep living. Mm -hmm. You're, you, you, Really liked this article. Tell me about it, Sasha. Tell me what you think about this. <laughs> I, you know, I, I just, I love it because it's, um, <clears throat> if you, if you read the article, it, it basically goes over the fact that you have this internal biome and, and er, you, you can, when you interact with people, when you kiss, when you, when you touch things or whatever, you're, you're transferring those to another environment and you know they it varies how successful they are when they transfer um remember when they were they discovered with death when your body dies and decomposes um those the basically all those those micros those biomes they go into the soil um and sometimes and and they usually they they thought that 
just the soil was just too um, too foreign a thing. But actually, it's not. Yeah, <laughs> that that was that was the surprising not. thing in here. Yeah, I mean, I think it was it was a little surprising that once your body dies, some of your biome, some of those bacteria mm -hmm. and everything, like, are released. Yeah inside of your body because your body is actively keeping them in check as you're moving and doing and running through your regular day your, your body is just existing it keeps certain things in check so the things are in balance and once that balance breaks that's how putrefaction starts yeah. i didn't know that that's i thought putrefaction was coming from an outside like yeast does or something no it just turns out that's your stomach Mm -hmm. Just your stomach taking over the rest of your body yeah. saying, ha, no, nobody's going to stop us anymore. And yeah. they just go through and eat everything in your body. And I'm like, huh, okay then. That makes sense. And then like you said, they found these things in grave sites. Yeah. It, years. That was the one. I was like, yeah, maybe for a couple weeks, you know, maybe a month outside of your body, something could Wow. A whole yeah, years later, that. those same biome stuff is tickling around down there in the earth, in the dirt, waiting to do something with you. Yeah. It's just expanding. I, I was I was a little disappointed that they did not talk about what happens during our modern embalming type stuff. Oh yeah. You know, does that kill off all those things? Locked well, in the coffin I mean, or not? It it preserves the body. I think I think it probably does a lot to to um, to stagnate or or stop the bulk of that. I mean, yeah. but clearly they're they're discovering this in in grave sites where people have been buried and had that happen. So it's still happening. It just probably yeah. doesn't happen as fast as it normally would. Yeah, it's it's a yeah. it's a it's a really interesting, weird little thing that just you know this, and this is why I'm so happy you found this study for me. <laughs> I'm like, this is cool. Wow, yeah. hey, huh? And now if I think about this, and like you said, you're sharing your biome as you kiss, and huh, maybe if that biome's there in that soil, and now we grow things in that soil, or you just are digging, and hmm, we can come up with all sorts of new weird stories based on this. Well, I guess essentially you're some a part of you is continued on. Yeah. Oh, it's it's, it's a great thing. It's a really on, nice completely. poetic thing there too. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Uh, our last story for the day is not quite as poetic. No. It is sort of final. So this is a story not for conspiracy theory people. Scientists are not lying to you about climate change, about the climate crisis. But they may not be telling you everything about it because they don't want you to feel despair. So this is partially an opinion column, but it's based on a lot of facts and it's based on interviewing scientists talking about the, the 1.5 C, 1.5 degrees of Celsius. If you've been following any of the climate change stuff, you know that we are rapidly approaching, if not passing the 1.5 mark, which means the planet's temperature has gone up. Mm -hmm. Obviously it is human causation to create, to push it this far, this fast. So humans are trying to stop that. We're trying to go to carbon neutral. We're trying to bring some of this stuff back, which is a great thing. But that 1.5, once we go past 1.5, there are some irreversible changes that happen to the planet. And scientists are kind of, it turns out, afraid of telling everybody exactly just how bad it's going to get because they don't want people to freak out and not try because yeah. of a fatalistic thing. Yeah. I mean, what are you working on for your own viewpoint on this? I mean, I kind of get where they're coming from. Like, because some people, they just want to bury their heads in the sand. Yeah. Like they don't want to accept that, you know, bad things are happening. And, um, 
there is a way to avoid or lessen the impact. Yeah. But you know, it's it's not guaranteed. It's not fast. It's it's over time. So I get where where somebody might be hesitant to lay it all out there. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's kind of hard though. Like for for I mean, if if you live in a place like we live in Florida, and um, and you go to the beach, or you or you snorkel, or you dive, and you've seen the reefs, there's no getting around the yeah. dead coral. Um, this this past summer, um, I went out to the dry tortugas with my kids and my husband, and um, it was very apparent that um, a lot of that coral was just gone. And yeah. I know that the a lot of the work locally here, like where they're they're trying to graft new coral that's more resistant to the temperature and everything, mm -hmm. they're even slowing on that because it's um it's still struggling. Yeah. So yeah. It is. And, and like like the poll quote here oh. is it's do you tell your kids we're doomed, or do you tell them, oh, it's gonna be okay if we work hard. If, and the poll quote is, if people understand the truth, the hope is they will want to fight it more. Yeah. Rather than giving in, like you said, putting your head in the sand, just ignoring it. Yeah. Well, it's too big of a problem. I can't solve it. It's just going to happen anyway. Yeah. But the idea of give humans, give people credit that they're going to fight and figure out a way to try and stop. And Admittedly, we're never going to stop and fully reverse, but at least find good ways of living with the problem. Yeah, pretty much. And that's, you know, it, uh, there was another little pull thing here about um, knowing, uh, you know, you're going to be late for work, but you're still going to try and get the work. You're not going to not go to work because you're late. Yeah. You're just going to try and get there as quickly as efficiently as possible and it may force you to basically think of new ideas and think of new ways of trying to get there and do that kind of stuff it's better to be one minute late than 10 minutes late pretty much is the uh, quote from there that that I, I was like hmm i kind i like that idea i really wish we could just kind of convince everyone like hey this is a super important thing. We all need to be, you know, all rowing in the same direction. Yeah. We should be able to do that. We should be able to have conversations like that. We hope. Hopefully other people will. Go tell us in the chat. Go tell us on the in the poll after when this gets posted up. Go tell us in there what you think about this. But you, we're going to pull back time a little bit for you. You have a very fun program coming up there at South Regional Library. Yes. Yes, I do. So take, the... some, take your mind off of everything and come. <laughs> tell us. Tell us about this. On the 14th of October, we have, um, it's 1993 again, 90s hip hop dance class. So we're going to have an instructor in and they're going to be teaching hip hop. It's so, no, yeah. any interest in revisiting the 90s and learning hip hop, I welcome you to come join us it's, on the it's, 14th. It's an interesting thing how many years it's been <clears throat> since this, hip hop came onto the scene uh, and has been a, a thriving musical force. Yeah, this year um, was the anniversary. Arlick uh, celebrated it. Yeah, I, I was kind of blown away by that a little bit. I was doing my Peloton exercise classes and there's like here 50 years of hip hop. And I'm like, no, yeah. it can't. No. Wow. It is. Oh, it is. Wow. It is. Okay. Then, huh? Um, yeah. Going to have to think about that. Yeah. I don't know that I want to take a dance class though at this point, but I do hope other people will come out and see this. It's a nice Saturday afternoon thing for you to come out and see. Yeah. Um, it'll be a fun time. Definitely. And thank you for being so fun here, Sasha. Uh, we will, if anybody has any questions about any programming, anything like that that's happening in the library, you can always go to broward.org slash library slash events. And those kind of comments and things, you can find all of this kind of stuff for everybody. 
And if you want to reach out to us and tell me what other libraries we should be featuring and what other librarians out there, creationstation at Broward.org comes right to me. And we'll see everybody next week.